I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occurred just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. I'm Taylor Sparks, an associate professor of material science and engineering at the University of Utah, and I'm joined by my co-host, Andrew Falkowski. And today we have a special guest, Dean Daryl Butt. Dean, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me, Taylor and, and Andrew. Um, so I'm a, a material scientist, uh, and I'm also the dean of the College of Mines and Earth Sciences. My background is really in materials for extreme environments, but I dabble a bit in art. So I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about what I know in the area of art. Yeah, I think it's pretty atypical to find scientists who have such equal footing in both science and art. I think sometimes we have this misnomer, this, this incorrect idea that if you're a scientist, you can't be an artist and vice versa. And Daryl's a great example of how you can be both and that there's a synergy between both. And that's really the topic of today's episode. Andrew, do you want to kick us off? Absolutely. Um, you know, when I was first reading through some of the papers that you sent us, I was really fascinated by the intersection within your work between science and art and how you like to involve people from different disciplines. Could you talk a little bit about that process and some of the things that are challenging and rewarding about that? Sure. The, you know, there, there are lots of interesting intersections between science and art. And um, I have to say that I've learned a lot about material scientists or about material science from artists. And I think that uh, artists learn a lot about their, their media from material scientists. Um, you know, I, I like to think a little bit about Leonardo da Vinci. He was a transdisciplinary uh, person who, who dabbled in both engineering and science, but, but he was a magnificent artist. And I, I think that there's no question that his, uh, his scientific abilities are what made him a great artist. And, and I think it's true both directions. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I was looking into as we prepared this episode is that um, science can make you a better artist and vice versa, but you can also use science to figure out things like forgeries, which I had never given much thought to before. And it's fascinating. There's actually a whole suite of different tools that people use, which a, a material scientist is very familiar with, but I would have never thought to apply them to a 18th century painting to figure out whether it's a forgery or not. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, and forgery is really sort of a small subset of it. You know, it's really about um, the topic of authenticity, whether or not a, a piece of art is forged or whether or not it was painted by a certain artist. And so there, there are lots of folks out there that want to understand where art came from, um, how it was handed down. And, uh, you know, whether it's legal to have um, is another issue, of course. Um, and there's all sorts of tools that you can use to, to sort that out. Um, examples for, are, for example, isotopes can be used to, to date things and determine um, the, the provenience to some degree. Um, there's some really interesting technology now, too, um, where we've documented the details of what a piece of art looks like through high-resolution photography. So if you, if you want to go to Google Art, um, you can zoom in on a painting now and see fingerprints and cracks, and, and you can actually look through the cracks and see the canvas underneath. And so with that kind of technology, it becomes virtually impossible to forge something because we have this incredible record of the art. Yeah, just before this call, I actually had a, a high resolution of the Mona Lisa up, and you can. I think they called it the lack allure. I can't remember the word for it was, but these tiny little cracks everywhere, I suppose, from when the paint dried, uh, which, you know, we understand that from things like mud cracks. Uh, you can see when, the, when it's drying away, there's this surface tension that creates this tiny micro cracks, or maybe this is a different aging effect, but I was surprised to see it. Yeah, and the advent of all these technologies to characterize different paintings and be able to detect forgeries are relatively recent. And, um, you know, if you, I was reading this book, it's called Artful Partners by Colin Simpson, and it describes this partnership between a leading authority in Italian Renaissance art, uh, Bernard Berenson, and this successful sort of suspect art dealer, 
uh, Joseph Devine. And so Berenson would authenticate all of these forgeries and then Devine would sell them at high prices, right? It was like, it was a money scheme. But back then there was no way to use any sort of scientific methods to deduce that these were forgeries uh, relative to now. And so these advancements have definitely allowed us to, to better detect forgeries and better characterize art. Yeah, you know, um, years ago, the, um, the way we sort of, and I'll use a metaphor here, shine light on an object was uh, uh, by simply looking at it and using human expertise. But today, when we shine light on an object, we can use synchrotrons and, and uh, ions and x-rays and, and uh, really get a much more detailed uh, look at a piece of art. And we can get some very unique fingerprints through technology that you can't get through the human eye. Are there any risks of damaging the paintings when using those methods? Like firing x-rays or ions, yeah. does it affect the pigments or the, the materials in use? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty small subset of experts that are allowed to take a, a valuable painting and put it in a synchrotron, for example. Um, it takes a considerable amount of expertise. So, so that's something you don't want to do at home, so to speak. Um, but um, sampling techniques now um, are starting to allow us to take very tiny specks of, for example, a pigment from a piece of art uh, that would be invisible to, to the human eye and then uh, stick it in a, uh, an instrument and look at it in, in great detail. And so um, it, it wouldn't be considered to be a non destructive technique, but it's virtually non-destructive. And uh, so that uh, is something that, um, you know, is uh, a little bit easier to do than to stick up, for example, a large painting or a, a piece of ceramic art into an instrument. That is so incredible. It's, uh, it's completely different tools than would have ever been available. So we're able to do just totally different things. I think that's awesome. Well, Dean, but uh, I think that you do something pretty unique. Uh, when you first came here to Utah, I remember hearing relatively early on that you did this uh, series where you would do come and paint with the Dean. And I remember thinking, what? This is so atypical. This is so unusual. Uh, but uh, then I've heard really great things about it. Can you talk about why do you do this as the Dean of the College of Mines and Earth Science? Why do you take time to do painting with the Dean? And are there some outcomes for, well, what are the outcomes that you're looking for when you do things like this? Yeah, so um, that's probably the funnest thing I do, to be honest. Uh, and um, that was something that um, our student success director asked me to do. And uh, my fear was that um, only a couple people would sign up, but it turns out it's been a, a sellout. And, um, you know, it's, it's very informal. We just get together and it's, it's students, staff, faculty, whoever wants to come. We've had people from not only my college, but other colleges come by and, and we just sit down and uh, I teach a little bit of art for a couple hours. And it's pretty amazing um, what kind of, uh, of uh, artwork people create, even if they don't have any experience at all. Um, but the benefit of it is really uh, that it's just an informal mechanism for uh, bringing people together and, uh, and having fun and sharing ideas. And uh, I wish I could do it now, but un unfortunately under uh, COVID, we're, we're, we're yeah. able to do that, but uh, we'll get back to it soon. Yeah, I think it's a pretty unique tool for inclusion and diversity and sort of bringing, casting a wider net for uh, people that could consider themselves to be scientists that wouldn't otherwise have ever thought about it. Anyway, uh, can you talk a little bit about how an understanding of science might have helped some of these traditional painters or artists be better at producing art? Yeah, you know, um, again, I go back to um, Leonardo da Vinci, who was um, uh, this transdisciplinary person. And as an example, um, da Vinci uh, was also a mountain climber. He used to love to, to climb in the mountains in northern um, Italy. And he would look out at the atmosphere and he would, he would study the effects of particles in the atmosphere on color. And one of the things he learned early was that as, uh, as, as things get farther away, the color yellow is the first thing to disappear and, and things far off tend to be lighter, whiter, bluer. Things close up tend to be darker, warmer, redder, and warmer colors in general. And, uh, and that ability, that, that sort of um, technique of scientific observation uh, made da Vinci uh, uh, a phenomenal artist and someone who could paint perspective and distance into his paintings with great effect. 
So just yesterday, you and I were in a meeting with a presenter from the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, and she showed, uh, you know, a big landscape piece, and it was it was, had sort of near objects and then moving further away. And I found myself paying attention to that, how the color changed, and how they did a good job of really making sure I could see the depth by the subtle change in, in the color and the and atmospheric effects. So I, I appreciate you pointed that out. Yeah, and, and that was a that was a Hudson River um, painting that you're referring to, one by Moran, um, and uh, uh, Moran um, was a was a pretty amazing artist, and his art um, reflected, um, in some cases, um, the mix between um, science and art and industry and humanity. And if and he was part of the Hudson River School of Artists, and um, one of the the uh, sort of traditions of the Hudson River School was to have artwork that reflected um, the, the collision between um, the frontier and industry. And so you often see that reflected in their paintings. I, it was fantastic. Now the inclusion of science in art, you know, we're talking about optics and atmosphere and how diffusion of light and diffraction tends to impact colors, but the science of the pigments themselves is also important. Uh, a lot of these artists back then, you know, they didn't have any stores they could go to to buy their own pigments. They had to make them themselves. And so they had to think about different concentrations and the colors that were going to be produced and the reactions. Can you talk a little bit about that and the sort of processes they used back then uh, versus the processes we use now? Yeah, so the processes we use now is you know, we go to the, the store and buy tubes of paint, <laughs> typically. Um, uh, you can still make your own paint, which is actually a, a really fun thing to do. In fact, I, I taught a course one semester, um, actually it was over a, a period of semesters where students in my class made pigments and then they, they made paint from those pigments. Um, and and so you know, cool. yeah, there, there's, there's different ways you can do it. I mean, you can, you know, if you look at the ochres, for example, that date back in, in the history of art 30,000 years, it was basically just taking rocks and grinding them up. Um, but uh, as time went on, it became more and more sophisticated and people learned that you could take things like plants and insects and, uh, and grind them up and, uh, or, or boil them in water and leach out um, dyes and then attach those dyes to um, what are called mordants. And so you can make these uh, very interesting colored pigments um, using um, a variety of natural materials, not just rocks, but, but insects and, 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 uh, and plants. And, uh, and that's still, in some senses, what we do today, um, but it's more sophisticated than that, of course. And um, there are also very interesting pigments that come from petroleum products and, and, and all kinds of other materials today. Um, but if you're interested um, enough, you can actually go online and you can buy all the ingredients to make your own pigments. And then from that, you can, you can make your own paints, which is, is something I've done in the past. And it's, it's, it's kind of like tying your own flies. It's a lot of fun. Are there advantages to the paint or is it just the, the fun of the process? I mean, I make sourdough bread and I do homemade grape juice and none of this is less work than just buying it from the store for sure, but you kind of do it for the process. Yeah. I think in, you know, in many ways you, you do it um, just for the pleasure of knowing that you, you, you made the paint yourself, but you can actually make paints that are of higher quality than you can purchase. Um, if you uh, just use raw linseed oil and, and, uh, and, and minerals together, you can make a paint that's of higher quality than you can purchase out of a tube. Um, because they don't have other additives. And okay. That in them. Yeah. And it's, it's well, also less expensive, I should add. <laughs> oh, is it really? Oh, yeah. I, I guess Absolutely. that makes sense. Yeah. When you did it with your class, with your students, were you using mostly synthetic materials or were you out having them grind up bugs and stuff? What were you doing? Yeah, no, I had a really creative uh, group of students that um, went out and got um, raw materials from all over the place. Um, uh, they, called people in Mexico and had them go out and pick lichen for them and, and mail it to them. Super uh, cool. Bought, so cool. Yeah. They bought bugs and, and, uh, uh, cochineal from Mexico and, uh, and, uh, they bought, uh, matter root. Um, and, and then they just took it and boiled it and made dyes and then attached it to, uh, to a mordant. Um, in one case, I had a student who was extremely creative, and he, he discovered a recipe 
um, that was about 2,000 years old in an old book um, by Pliny the Elder. Wow. And uh, he, he made a purple pigment um, by fermenting his own urine. And uh, it was pretty fascinating. Um, it was quite a vivid purple, by the way. So That's amazing. It was an experiment cool. that, he, that he did at home. I, I, I didn't <laughs> allow him to do it in the house. So. <laughs> So you mentioned Pliny the Elder, and uh, that gets me thinking, you know, this, is, this, this art goes so far back in the past, and it has me wondering, the art that they made back then, it can't be the same as, even if it's still survived to the modern era, and we take a look at it, it probably isn't how it looked back then, because we know that things like oxidation and corrosion and, you know, weathering can happen. Um, what do we know about how art changes over time? Um, and then how does this influence how we could try and preserve or conserve or even uh, you know, reproduce art that's been damaged over time. Yeah, you know, the reality is that that um, generally speaking, art is thermodynamically unstable, um, like <laughs> like we are, and um, most art uh, over time disappears. Um, you know, the beauty of ceramic art is that um, in some cases it is actually um, thermodynamically stable and it's going to last a very, very long time. Um, but the vast majority of art, things made from polymers and metals in particular, um, like everything else, deteriorate due to heat, humidity, um, et cetera, thermal cycling. And, um, you know, we can protect art, but we have to face the fact that art over enough years will will go away. Um, there are some interesting things going on um, now to preserve art. Um, one of the things we do is to replicate art um, and, and to make an object that that looks just like that piece. It's basically a forgery, although it's we, we, we it's, it's a legal forgery. And we put that on the on in exhibits rather than the actual piece of art. And so the actual piece of art might be put in storage. Um, now, now Daryl, is this more than just like taking a picture of it, like a high resolution photo and printing it? Yeah, so there, there's um, a, a really interesting example is some technology that's been developed by Fujifilm and uh, in the, um, the Van Gogh Museum in, in Europe. And uh, they've developed a technique for um, casting paintings. Uh, and basically they, they put a no polymer way. onto a painting and peel it away and then they create this mold of the painting and they can go in and then fill that mold and it'll have exactly the same texture wow. as the original painting and then they'll they'll print um, the colors onto it and not only do they make a, a painting that has the cracks and maybe the fingerprints and the insects and the, the plants etc that are stuck in Van Gogh's painting but they'll also um, make a replica of the frame itself. And if you flip it around, it looks like the original um, as well. Um, so that's, that's a pretty interesting technology that allows you to make these magnificent pieces of art that look like the original. Um, and then you can store the original somewhere else. That is incredible. Is it, who has access? Is this like the Louvre only, or who can do this? Well, uh, I believe it's the technology is um, patented by by Fujifilm, and uh, you can buy one of these paintings if you have enough money. They usually will make a couple hundred of them and and sell them for a, a fair price. They're they're less than the original, but <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, what are your thoughts on restoration? I know this is a very controversial subject within the art uh, uh, community. Um, the big example that I'm familiar with is the Sistine Chapel. Um, even before we developed a lot of the modern restoration techniques we have now, people started to notice that it was degrading. And so they did all this stuff with like bread and olive oil, trying to spread it to dissolve some of the stuff. Um, but a lot of the community, I think there was a big restoration of it recently, a very famous restoration that was very controversial, where they actually did some damage and changed some of the coloring. Um, so I wanted to get your opinion on that. And uh, do you think the technology is worth it? Or should we probably just try to seal it away where it's protected and make copies? Yeah, so so restoration is a is a very controversial um, topic. There are there are definitely different schools of thought, um, and there are, there are those who are completely opposed to uh, restoring a piece of art. Um, in, in, and it's it's a it's it's a um, it is an art in itself. You know, there's a lot of science behind it, but the the act of re 
restoring a piece of art requires tremendous artistic skill in some cases or precision, as well as uh, a, a great deal of scientific understanding. There, there are pieces of art that, you know, are perhaps not um, uh, irreplaceable or not incredibly precious, and it's fine to uh, go in and try to restore that, those, those items. But in, in cases where um, it's a masterpiece, um, you know, I think the school of thought is in general, um, you know, we, we don't restore them, um, or if we do, it's, it's to a very limited degree. And when art is restored today, um, typically people also will, will document it and sort of fingerprint it so that we know how and where that art was restored. Um, Oftentimes, if you look at a, a painting, for example, that's been restored, it, it may have sat on a basement floor. And so if you go and look at the bottom of the painting, that's usually where most of the degradation oh, yeah. occurred. Uh -huh. And you'll oh. notice that, that restorers today will, will actually often um, restore by painting in, in vertical um, lines as opposed to uh, just painting like the artist did. And that way you, you sort of have a fingerprint that, that that piece of art was was restored. But it is something you want to be very careful about. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Daryl, could you tell us some of the differences right there? I, I remember earlier in this conversation, you mentioned that they take the pigment, I think that's the word you use, and they attach it to the mordant. Can you unpack some of this terminology? What's the difference between pigments, dyes, paints to somebody who doesn't know anything? What are some of these differences? Yeah, sure. So a, a, a dye um, is, uh, is usually a, uh, an organic in solution. And um, uh, so, for example, if you take uh, the insect cochineal and grind it up, it'll make a nice red dye. And in fact, that red dye um, uh, is uh, the, the same color that the, uh, the British wore during the Revolutionary War. Uh, cool. And, uh, and that dye, if you were to take it and mix it into a, a binder, um, like linseed oil, it, it wouldn't make a, a paint. But if you take that dye, um, and you attach it to a clay particle or silica, um, it'll adhere to that particle. And when you dry it, um, it'll, it'll be red and, uh, in, and it'll be stable in that form. And then you can take that um, pigment and mix it into a binder and uh, make a paint. So the difference between a dye and a pigment is that the pigments are solid and the dye is in solution. And do we find that a lot of places were limited by, in terms of the, the color palettes and the pigments that they could use by what was available? Was there a lot of development of trading routes for these materials to develop pigments, or was it not economical enough to, to ship all of these things? Yeah, you know, um, you can... Um you can literally write books on colors. And if you, if you, if you are, are interested in this, there are, um, for example, entire books written on the color red or the color blue or the color purple. And, um, you know, uh, pigments um, at times in history were incredibly valuable. Uh, lapis lazuli, for example, is a blue rock from Afghanistan that was very, very va valuable and, uh, and quite precious. And, and you'll find uh, rare examples of this pigment used in, in uh, paintings, uh, for example, that Leonardo painted. Um, and so uh, another example I mentioned, cochineal earlier, cochineal, um, was uh, a pigment that was discovered in Central America um, during the 1500s, I believe. And um, pirates used to invade um, or attack ships heading from Central America to Europe that contained cochineal because this red color was so valuable. Um, so uh, these, these pigments... Um, have so cool. incredible stories associated with them. It's a, it's a pretty fascinating area. So maybe as an add-on, thinking about modern day, um, if you don't have these supply lines or if a, if a pigment isn't sustainable, I know that there's work on, you know, there's still modern pigments being developed. One of the guys in my field uh, that I saw at a conference was talking about uh, new blue pigment, right? I think he was trying to either replace the cobalt or the indium. I don't know what it was. Indian, he was trying I think, to, yeah. 
Is that what it was? But uh, I was surprised to see modern research happening on ceramic materials as pigments. Um, is this something that you're aware of that you follow? Uh, a little bit, you know, um, uh, there are still people working on uh, developing pigments. Um, there, you know, the, the, the vast majority of colors are available to, to, the, to, to most artists. So any new pigments um, that are developed are, are in, in terms of color, the differences are pretty subtle. Um, but there are still, um, you know, I would say some holy grails out there that, that haven't been uh, um, found. For example, um, lead-based paints are uh, still have really incredible properties. and We haven't found ways to replace them necessarily. Um, cadmiums. Um, there are replacements for cadmiums, but um, uh, I love cadmium paint, and I can tell you that the replacements for cadmium just don't quite cut it. So there are people still out there trying to develop pigments. Often it's not to try to, you know, um, achieve a certain color, but it's more to try to uh, develop something that is more sustainable, is uh, healthier for the environment as well as the artist. To follow up on that, are there any ancient pigments that we still haven't figured out what they're made of or how to recreate them? When you described the process, it seemed rather complicated and it looked like there could be enough steps to make it difficult to try to, you know, backtrack it to what it's actually made of. Yes, so, you know, I think the answer is probably yes. Um, you know, we're, you know, um, we, uh, probably know how to make just about anything today, but um, I think we've lost a lot of the science that, that um, especially the Egyptians and the, and the Romans and the Greeks uh, pursued 2,000 years ago. And uh, one example is related to actually a paper that we just published um, on the color purple. And uh, we, we, there's a, a period of time where um, Egyptians painted um, their portraits in the very Romanesque way onto wood. And there are about a thousand of these, um, what are called um, Egyptian portraits. And uh, some of them had purple pigments on them. And I had a class that looked at these pigments and um, tried to reverse engineer them. And the one thing we're pretty confident of is that the pigments were synthetic, but we're not entirely sure how they made them. And uh, the Egyptians were pretty innovative they uh, very likely made these pigments by uh, taking plants like a matter root or an insect, um, making a dye from it. And then um, they probably shifted the color um, maybe from red into the purple um, spectrum by adding salts to it. And then from that made a pigment by, by attaching it to a mordant. And uh, so um, I think there's a lot that we don't know about um, some of these ancient Egyptian pigments. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's um, very um, difficult to reverse engineer something that happened 2,000 years ago. But I think one thing we're sure of is that the Egyptians knew a lot more about the chemistry of pigments and dyes um, than... Uh, we may have thought, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. It's pretty amazing what they've done. That's phenomenal. So this is maybe a good segue. You mentioned that you had this recent publication. So there is still a field in the science community for doing research and investigations in this area. And, you know, one of the places where you can do that is through the American Ceramic Society, who's a sponsor of this episode. And the American Ceramic Society is a, a place near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's where I published my first journal article when I started my PhD journey was in the Journal of the American Ceramic Society. And they actually have a division it's uh, the, what is it, the Art, Archaeology, and Conservation Science Division? Am I getting that right? AACS? Yeah, that's I think right. that's what it is. Yep. Um, and they actually hold, uh, as typically, a, a session or a symposium inside of the larger conferences, the ACERS annual meetings, where they have people like yourselves come and present these research topics. Have you presented these before? And can you talk about the AACS in general? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great division. Um, and uh, I, I do attend their meetings. I've given a couple talks and helped with some workshops. And um, it's also um, one of the more diverse divisions, uh, too. It's, it's, it's incredibly fun when you go to these meetings. Um, you'll have uh, a very diverse group of people in terms of gender and ethnic background, but also in terms of their discipline. Um, it attracts people from all different fields. And the, they, they hold a, 
a, a session at the MSMT meeting every other year. And then the off years, they, they have events um, at other uh, workshops. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So it's a great organization to be part of too. Oh yeah. Like I said, it was the first one I ever joined. Are there things that the AACS division does outside of those meetings? Do they have other events happening around the year? Or I, I assume that there's publications in the, like the bulletin or something like that, the ceramic bulletin? Yeah. So the, um, they, they have had some other events. Uh, they sometimes will connect with some of the other divisions like the glass division. And uh, I think it was two years ago, they held a, a workshop on um, glass art. And they also held a, a workshop at, at uh, Stanford at Slack on um, using uh, synchrotron techniques for analyzing art. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of random in a way. Um, they, they try to do something unique and different every other year. So you just got to kind of keep an eye out for it. So throughout this episode, you've told us a little bit about how art can be informed by science. But in your opinion, what are some ways that science could be more informed by art? Um, you know, what ways can, art, can scientists incorporate artistic techniques or artistic thinking into their work to try and either make it more beautiful, more effective, um, or more interesting? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think um, we have been using art in our science and engineering um, for, for a very, very long time. We might not always recognize it, but um, if you look at some of the automobiles of the 1930s, um, they were incredible pieces of art. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in some ways, you know, um, almost everything you do as a, as a um, if, if if you're working in material science or or uh, engineering fields in general, um, you, you're, you're often, in a sense, using your imagination to create something that is, you know, both functional and ideally also beautiful, and has some sort of aesthetic value. And uh, so I think art is, you know, um, it's it's an inherent part of all of us. Um, and when we create something, um, even though we might be using engineering techniques and scientific techniques, um, whether we know it or not, um, we are often applying art as well. Well, Dean, we really appreciate this conversation. It's fascinating. Um, are there other resources or books that you think that the material science community would really just love to get their hands on if they wanted to learn more? Yeah, you know, um, if if you are interested in um, sort of the science of art um, and cultural heritage in general, uh, there's a really nice book by uh, Gilberto Artoli, Artioli, I think is how you say his name, and it's called Scientific Methods in Cultural Heritage. Um, you know, there, there are just a lot of really wonderful art books out there. Um, one of my favorites is um, uh, called Color by Victoria Finley. And, and um, it's, a, it's a real easy read, but it's a fascinating book on um, not only the science of color, but it, she also um, traveled around the world going to certain areas where various colors and pigments sort of originated. Um, and, uh, and, it's a, and she tells the story about the history of color, the psychology of color, the meaning of color. And uh, it's a really fun place to start if you're interested in, in just sort of color in general. So cool. Well, thank you again for joining us. We're going to say one more thanks to our sponsors, uh, MapMatch. If you haven't heard of MapMatch before, it's an awesome website that helps you find actual producers of all these wonderful materials that we like to talk about. So you don't just have to look up in the appendix of your book. You can find somebody who will actually make it for you, whether it's aluminum, steel, or maybe even art supplies. So check out mapmatch.com. Learn more about that. It's free to use, which makes it nice for all of you out there. And if you're somebody who produces materials, get in touch with them. Think about having it listed on their website because it has over a million users right now. Uh, also a sponsorship from Materials Today. Uh, so if you haven't heard of Materials Today, it's an excellent journal published by Elsevier. We encourage you to check them out as well as their other related programs and conferences. And we've already mentioned the Art, Archaeology, and Conservation Science Division of the American Ceramic Society, who's been a, a, a new sponsor for this episode. So with that, we're also thankful for the people who make the music possible. And Dean, thanks for joining us this week. Thanks for chatting with me. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can send us emails at materialism.podcast at gmail.com.
You should also, if you haven't already, follow our Instagram page, materialism.podcast. We've been posting a lot more content, including a bunch of very cool demos that show some interesting material science concepts. So if you want to learn even more about material science, be sure to follow us. Um, additionally, through our partner Materials Today, uh, we're going to make a bunch of articles on art forgery and the science of art available. We'll put those in the show notes. You can check those out and read even more if you found this fascinating. So we'll catch you next time. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. <laughs>